First things first. At the time of this experience, I was 24 years old, living with my then fiance, now husband, who we'll call B, and my four year old daughter, who we'll call S. B worked nights six days a week. We lived in a notoriously bad neighborhood, but up until this one week, my naive self figured if I minded my own business, I would be impervious to bad things happening, right? Right. Before we get to that night, the night of the main event, there are three seemingly insignificant events that happen in the week leading up to that night. For you to get the full picture, I'll go over those first. Event 1. Sunday around 2am, my 4 year old comes downstairs into the living room where my husband and I were watching TV on his day off. I hop up and start to direct her back to bed when she says, There is a man in our backyard. Is he your friend? I turn to look wide-eyed at B, who, without further prompting, goes upstairs and looks out her window. Due to the bright back porch light, my daughter's window actually does have the best view of the backyard. After several minutes, he comes down with a shrug. I don't see anyone, and nothing's been moved. So I chalk it up to a bad dream and take S back to bed. Event number two. Tuesday. I have two cats. Because I have two cats, I do not open my screens to my windows. They are strictly inside cats. On this night, it was pouring out. No thunder or lightning, but pouring. My neighbor calls me and says, Is your cat supposed to be outside? He's on the porch. I reply, No, thank you for calling. I'm letting him in now. After letting in my poor drenched cat, I set about looking for how he got out. It didn't take long to find the dining room window was open just about six inches. This is when I started to get a little freaked out. This was an old house. The screens were hard to open. It took a considerable amount of effort to open them, and after asking my husband, I knew neither of us had opened it. Yet again, I figured I was just being paranoid. Perhaps S had figured out how to open it. Event number three. Thursday. Night again, be at work. My outside dog, Vega, would not stop barking. This was unusual. He likes being outside, especially at night. We didn't have AC at the time, and it was cooler outside than it was inside. He just started barking, and barking, and barking. After about an hour and a half, I called him inside, but his behavior became even more bizarre. When I called him in, he would bound up the back steps into the house. However, then he would pace by the back door, like he does when he wants to go out. I don't want him keeping up the neighbor with his constant barking tonight, so I ignored him. Within two minutes, his pace turns into loud whining and determined scratching at the door. So, after ten minutes of this, I cave and let him back outside, where he immediately starts barking again. Just a maddening, constant bark. This goes on for about two hours before he finally stops. Friday, the main event. S and I are sitting on the couch past bedtime. B, as usual, was at work. We were watching Tangled for the hundredth time. I had just finished painting her nails and told her when the movie was over, no more whining, it was time for bed. Now remember that window that my cat got out of? It is visible from the couch and vice versa. This is important. Over the movie, I heard what sounded like a tap. I paused the movie. Nothing. Weird, but whatever. I start the movie again. Tap, tap, tap. Three seconds, then tap, tap, tap. I don't even have to pause the movie. I know there is tapping, and my gut starts to twist in knots. I have anxiety, though. It's probably nothing, and then my brain starts going into overdrive. There are no branches, no trees, bushes, or decorations near that window. No brain, you're overreacting, stop it. I get up from the couch and go over to the window. The reflection of the dining room light keeps me from being able to see anything but darkness in my own reflection, so I act like I'm just adjusting the curtain. Then my other dog, Coco, catches my eye. This normally happy-go-lucky puppy is staring at the window, hackles raised, teeth bared and growling the most terrifying growl. I mean, I have never heard her make that sound before. 
I stay calm and walk back over to the couch and send S to bed. I wanted to keep acting normal. I don't know why, but I was afraid that if whoever was outside my window knew that I knew they were there, that they may act aggressively. I sat down on the couch again and called B. I explained what was happening, and all the while the tapping had resumed. B told me to call the police, so I did. Ten minutes pass. Tap, tap, tap. Twenty, then thirty minutes pass. Still no police. Tap, tap, tap. I called B again. He is furious the police aren't there yet. He tells me he's leaving work now. He works thirty minutes away. Tap, tap, tap. Coco is glued to my hip. She wouldn't move from my side, all the while growling. Finally, fifty minutes after my call, red and blue lights turn on in front of my house, shouting. Then I hear our car with its unmistakable squeaky brakes coming up the drive. Only after I heard B's voice on the porch did I dare open the door. Sure enough, the police were putting a man in handcuffs into the police car. When they had pulled up, they saw the guy and nabbed him. The one police officer just nonchalantly said, Oh, he was just probably going to rob you when you went to bed. Once they left, B told me that there's Slim Jim wrappers next to our fence, at least ten of them. The man was feeding my dog so he wouldn't bark. While the officer was putting him in the car, the dispatcher was naming off his priors. One of them was assault. From where he was at the window, he could see both me and my four-year-old on the couch. Because of the first three events I wrote about, I'm fairly certain this man was watching our house. He knew B worked at night and that if he didn't bring food, my outside dog would tell the whole neighborhood someone was in the yard. He knew he could quietly open the window. I'm afraid to think about what could have happened had I not heard the tapping, if Coco hadn't reacted the way she did. We moved two weeks later, and I hope that nothing like this ever happens again. When I was about 23 to 24, I met a very attractive Spanish guy I went to high school with at the gym. I didn't know he knew who I was because I was very shy in high school and had my swim team friends and my close friends. Other than that, I was very quiet in high school and kept to myself while he played sports and was very popular. We started talking in the gym parking lot and he asked for my number. I found him attractive and athletic. I was a very curvy plus size girl so finding me attractive really surprised me. I agreed to meet up with him and go on a date. Wrong idea. We went on a date to a very small local bar where many of the rural southerners would go to grab a drink. Mind you this bar was very tiny and had one room with the bar and a connecting room that had a couple pool tables. We stuck out a little as many of the people that went there looked like they had done drugs or drank heavily or smoked their whole life. I brushed off the feeling of displacement and tried to enjoy my evening. That's where it got very strange. There was this thin woman, probably a little older than us, with her ex-mother-in-law hitting on the guy I was with. I didn't let it bug me, but I could tell he was not interested. He had made a couple of comments earlier about how he liked my size and we really had nothing to talk about, so I thought maybe we were not compatible, but I was trying to enjoy the night. I went to the bathroom in the small bar and probably was gone for five to ten minutes reapplying my lipstick and looking in the mirror. When I came back, he flipped out on me saying I was talking to other guys. Let me remind you, this bar had very sketchy older men with long beards or men that looked like they were old enough to be my grandparents, so I explained no, I was in the bathroom. He didn't believe me and kept going on and on about me talking to other men. When it was time to go, I was more than ready to leave. I really didn't feel this was going anywhere and I was ready to go home. He then decided to not drive me home straight away, but to a small dimly lit pond in the rural area where no one was around. That's when I started freaking out. I asked him to take me home, but he refused and asked for us to go walking by the pond. I don't know what his intentions were, but it read red flags. I kept begging him telling him I really needed to be home and he started getting furious with me, saying that me talking to guys at that bar really hurt him. 
I knew this guy was not well and finally convinced him to bring me home after crying and screaming that I didn't want to be here. We got back to my house and he tried grabbing my leg telling me I shouldn't be working out and he liked his girls a little chubby. I pulled away and told him it was time for me to go. He was so furious with me but I managed to get out of his car, walk quickly to my house and lock the door. I then texted him it wasn't working out and it was best to just move on. I stopped going to the gym the same time he would and eventually stopped going to that gym altogether. I'm 28 now and keep to myself at any gym I go to. To the guy I thought was attractive but ended up being a creep. I hope we never run into each other again. I work at the Walmart near where I live. At the time this story occurred, I had been working there for a little over three years. I was working one night at the customer service desk where I normally worked. It was a usual night. Understaffed, busy, exhausting, a typical shift at Walmart. I had a long line of people and I was the only one at the desk. Because it was so busy, I was trying to get my line down as quickly as possible. One guy in line looked a little bit different than the others. He was tall, Caucasian, appeared to be in his late 20s to early 30s, was wearing a short pair of shorts, had a button-up shirt on that wasn't buttoned all the way, had long dreadlocks that almost touched the floor, and had a pair of sunglasses on his head. It wasn't his appearance that stood out to me. I've always made it a goal to not jump to conclusions based on what people look like. I hate stereotypes and I don't want to be another one who subconsciously endorses them. He was returning a printer, had his receipt, the serial numbers matched, everything was there. Nothing really out of the ordinary. What got me was the way he smiled and talked to me. He spoke as if though he was intoxicated and he gave a smile that looked like something you'd see in a horror movie. A big smile with big wide eyes. What was even creepier was as I refunded him his money he smiled at me and stared at me as he slowly turned around and walked away. I thought it was a little weird at first but I let it go because that was the first time I'd ever saw this guy. I really started to get creeped out when he began to regularly come into the store, returning more printers. He began coming back so much we eventually gave him the nickname Printer Guy. When I saw Printer Guy for the second time I thought maybe he just tried another printer and it didn't work either. I tried not to think too much about it, but as the days and weeks went on it became a routine for Printer Guy to come into the store and return printers. He would come to the store, return a printer or two, and would go back to the electronics to get more. We knew he didn't steal them because he always had the receipt. He went through the self-checkouts every time. The workers saw him ring up each one and pay for them. But why would one person need so many printers? Eventually, security started watching him. The day security and management told us not to take any printers back from him was the day he made it obvious he was up to something. He returned five printers in one day. Now, it's none of my business, but one person does not need that many printers. The last time I returned a printer for him was that same day. He came up and asked me what was up. He was talking to me casually, just like the other times, but before I could even start the transaction, he leaned over to me and said, And between you and me, you don't need to know what I'm doing with all these printers. That's when I became absolutely terrified. I took that as code for don't be in my business. But he then told me that his dog went missing and he was returning the printers to collect a reward for someone who found his dog. Whether he was telling the truth about his dog or not, that's when it became clear. He was buying the printers to print out flyers and when he used all the ink, he would bring them back to get more. The printer is usually cheaper than the ink, so it makes sense why he would buy printers that already come with ink and then return them. After I gave him the money back for the printers he was returning, he once again gave me a weird smile and stared at me, saying, I'll see you around. At that point, I didn't feel comfortable being around this guy. My other coworkers didn't either. I didn't want to jump to conclusions, but the way he acted then really made me fear for my safety. 
I just didn't feel like he was all there mentally. I told security what he had said to me and that was when the day management said we could no longer take any printers back from this guy. The last night I ever saw a printer guy in the store, I was giving a break at the self-checkouts. At this point, most of my coworkers and supervisors were waiting for him to come back. We were told by management to call them whenever we saw him again. When he came into the store, he looked over at me and asked me how I was doing. He looked at me once again with that creepy smile and stare and said, It's good to see you. As he went to the service desk to return four more printers, one of my supervisors told him that we wouldn't take any more printers back because he had returned so many. He was at the desk for a couple of minutes and then slowly walked out of the store. His creepy smile was gone only to reveal a petrifying look of anger. That was the last time I ever saw a printer guy. I don't know what became of him. I don't know if he's still buying and returning printers. I don't know if he really had a dog that went missing, and if he did, I don't know if he found him. Walmart has a way of attracting many types of people. I've seen a lot of things while I've worked for the company, but he was the creepiest person I've ever come in contact with at the store. Walmart does have low prices, but that definitely comes at a higher cost. If you find yourself in a Walmart or any public place for that matter, just be careful. You never know what type of people are lurking around the corner. For contextual reasons, I'm a 16-year-old born in the UK. This happened during the summer. I had just finished my final GCSE exams, final exams you take during school in the UK, and had 10 weeks of playing games and sleeping until past 10 every morning. As any kid would be, I was super excited for no school, and I had planned with my school friends to play games all summer. At about a week into going to bed at 3am every morning, me and my friends had become good friends with an American that, for privacy reasons, I'll call Jake. Jake soon became friends with us and we played with him every day. He must have been in his mid-twenties and was pretty good at the games we played. No one saw anything off of him because he seemed to play all day in our hours and his hours. This didn't bother us though, as he was able to progress in the game at the same time. Things seemed normal and fun, until we met another person. I'll name this girl Jane. She was a funny and nice girl, and me and my close friends didn't mind playing with her as she was good at the game and was also in an American time zone, so she could play at times we couldn't. After a day or two, I started to realize that Jake was attempting to flirt with Jane now. Jane was a girl in her mid-twenties, but she also had a child that must have been around two or three that lived with her permanently. This didn't seem to bother Jake. A few days later, I realized that Jane wasn't playing with us anymore. Me and my close friends couldn't think why, as we had been doing really well recently and we were all having fun. I asked Jake. He said he had no clue why she had stopped playing. I asked her directly and she seemed quite upset. I asked why. Jane said that he hurled abuse at her for no reason, screaming at her and telling her all these terrible jokes about assault and forcing himself upon her. As anyone would be, I was pretty mad at Jake. I just couldn't understand why he would say such things to a young woman who lives alone with her infant son. We stopped playing with Jake, and Jane decided she didn't want to play with anyone now. However, me and my friends still kept in touch with her every now and then, the next day I get a message from Jane saying that Jake was continuing to message her. These messages were even worse than the first, this time targeting her infant son. He threatened that he would come to her house and do all of this himself. The messages eventually stopped, yet she still feared for her and her family. It just goes to show you, you never know who you truly are playing with online. I'm a 19 year old dude, I used to work for a pizza place. It's like a subway with pizza, you can come in, choose your size of the pizza and add whatever you want and we never charge extra. I decided to work there after I graduated because during the year I started I had a lot going on that year and 
Having a job with flexible hours where I didn't need to work for my days off and the plan was eventually quit once I started college and get a better job. Months went by at my job with the typical stuff, bad customers, angry people, dumb stuff that anybody in retail or fast food has been through. We closed either at 11 or 10 regardless. At my dismay, the worst that would happen is somebody comes in at 10.50 or 9.50 and orders, but after that, it would be normal. No people and just us employees working to get home. This will be important later. I like most of the people I worked with. Some people were annoying, lazy, or outright creepy, but they move on or were fired, so it never got to me. But a month before the incident that caused me to write on here, a 21-year-old girl started working with us. She was actually quite great. Beautiful, super nice, and the cherry on top. Great worker. We'll call her Lacey for this story. No real names will be used, obviously. I always found myself to be told all my coworkers gossip in their life. I could never tell you why, but I never minded lending an ear and giving advice. Lacey was no exception. After a few weeks, she told me about her boyfriend. In our area, we have a lot of the wealthy, not the Beverly Hills wealthy, but the 200k a year wealthy, and a lot of these wealthy people were country nobodies. Here actually fits that title, but they like to hunt, fish, listen to country, and ride ATVs and all that. Her boyfriend was the son of one of these people. Trucks, hunting, and nice outdoor equipment, he always had the nicest stuff, and a nice truck all bought by dad. Her story went like this. He was abusive, always asked to hook up when she wasn't ready, and would belittle her if he didn't get his way. After months of dealing with this, she finally called it off, and as you can imagine, he was not happy. Calling her all sorts of names you can think of, and even his father joined in because of course dad had to. But she shrugged it off and told me, he'll move on, he's just trying to be tough. She told me this, and I gave her my advice, and told her a shortened version of my abuse story so she knows she's not alone, and we moved on. A week goes by and her and I are closing with one of our managers who we'll call James for the story. A manager must be closing with us every night. I know this is already long, but for you to understand, you must understand the layout of the store. As you walk in the store to your left is the line, in front of you is the seating area, it's a self-seat place, by the way. The line has all the toppings, and you follow through, going through until your pie is done, and go to the register and seat yourself, and behind the line there is a table, and on the other side the fire oven. In the back, there is more seats, and a left turn to a hallway leading to bathrooms, and to the right in that hallway is an exit that is locked once you go outside. Like I said, we're closing... I am on lobby, so sweeping, chairs up, and bathrooms, and Lacey is on kitchen, wrapping the line with plastic and cleaning the oven with our manager in back doing dishes. It's one of those nights when we close at 11 and it's now 12 or so, and I look out the main door and see four large trucks pull up. One was brand new and all white and raised, and the two extra wheels in the back, and the others are older early 2000s and all that. They pull up in a line, lights on bright, and my thoughts are, you suck, but at least we're closed. Two guys hop out of each truck, so we're talking eight guys standing in front of their trucks, lights blaring into the store. As I start to realize how this could be bad, Lacey shouts, that idiot, and I walk up and she tells me, that's my a-hole boyfriend, and my manager hears this and walks out and realizes what's going on. Me and James head outside and try to calm this down. Hey man, it's over. We've got work to do and she's done. James shouts this with both of us standing in the door. Well, Lacey's boyfriend did not like this and with his arms crossed, mean mug and all shouts, Shut up. I want to speak to Lacey. Before we could respond, Lacey squeezes between us and stands tall and shouts, Yeah, real mature, coming to my work. They shout typical angry ex stuff before the one comment stands out. You broke my heart. You and your stupid friends are going to hurt real bad. James has had enough and pushes us back in and shouts at us to run to the back. I take Lacey to the back into the exit. I look back before we turn the corner and see it. The guys are getting out bats and large sticks and large tire iron ready to attack. James is pushing stuff against the door. 
I hold Lacey behind the corner and as James pushes another table, the guys start pushing the door, trying to punch James, and he knows it's time to bail, and runs the corner with us. We empty into the back and run down the road behind the huge stores in our outlet mall our store sits in and call the police. After ten minutes of talking with the police, we hear the sirens of multiple cars and we run back and find the store trashed, fridges dented by swings, food thrown all over, and a cracked window from a thrown chair. After filling out my report and thanking James for his bravery and I say sorry to Lacey, who's an absolute mess at this point, we all take many days off for the store to be repaired and I take an extra week to recover. When I came back, Lacey had quit and apologized because she believed it was all her fault and her ex was later arrested for his actions and his court date is soon. Lacey, I hope you're okay. James, you are a true hero. And trucker rich kid, let's never meet again. Ever since I was a kid, I've dreamt of finding a secret room in my house. It seemed like such a magical thing to have a secret place to be hidden from the real world. As high as my hopes have been, I, just now as an adult, found a hidden room in my current house and I really wish I hadn't. I rent a room in a house with three other guys. They all have bedrooms on the second floor of the house while my room is basically a semi-finished attic. For my taste, it's actually a really cool room. When I moved in, the room was mostly furnished. There was a bed frame which fit my mattress. There was a big dresser and there was a desk and chair. For the first few months, I left the orientation of the room as it was, but just the other day I decided I was going to change things up. As I moved the heavy dresser away from the wall, I spotted a tiny door. By tiny, I mean maybe two feet wide by three feet tall. I was intrigued. I noticed that the latch on the door was fastened by a zip tie, and seeing as my room was the attic, I figured this was a step taken to avoid any kind of draft. Out of curiosity, I cut the zip tie and opened up the small door. I was met by pitch blackness. I had a desk lamp pointing through the tiny doorway, but it did little to cut through the darkness. I crawled through the tiny door with my phone light. As soon as I entered, I felt like something was off. Almost immediately, I got hit with a bad sense of the spins and started feeling motion sick. I managed to get out back into my bedroom and felt such a powerful and unexplainable sense of dread and panic that I was sick in my trash can for several minutes. Eventually, I began to regain my composure and as soon as I did, I took a shoelace and retied the latch on that door and pushed the dresser back in front of it. I am still living in the same room and have been having nightmares about that dresser sliding away and that door opening up. I'm not sure what happened in that room and I also really don't want to find out. I can't afford to break my lease and find a new place so it looks like I'll be here for a little while. Update. Shortly after this happened I had a streak of bad luck which amplified the feeling of dread. This had been going on for a couple of months when I met up with a childhood friend we'll call Sarah. Sarah is very interested in the paranormal and is a Wiccan. When she first saw me that day, her bubbly demeanor quickly turned to one of deep concern. She said, No offense, but you look terrible. I told her what had happened and the feelings and nightmares I'd been having. At that point, I'd also gotten strange bruises on the back of my shoulders which for the life of me I couldn't explain. When I showed her the bruises, the look of concern turned to a look of horror. She went into her car and came out with a bundle of sage and burned it as she waved it all over me. She then gave me a couple of bundles and told me to burn them in my room. When I asked her why, she replied, You don't see it? Those bruises look like tiny handprints. She went on to say I could have picked up something when I went in that little room. After that, I made a habit of burning sage. I know it's an aggressive and risky technique, but it seems to be working in my case. It's been about a year since I opened that door and I'm living in the same room. The dresser is still holding the door shut and nothing weird has really happened, but I still try to stay out of the house. I'll be able to move out soon. 
Hopefully the next house has no hidden rooms like that one. When I was little, probably around four or five, my cousin told me and my brother, who was two years younger than me, about something called the Nakgrab. I don't remember exactly what she said it was. I think she said it was a ghost, though I always thought of it and still do as some sort of paranormal creature. In order to encounter it, she said, we'd have to close the shutters in front of the window so that it would be totally dark inside the room and then call its name. We usually did this in my grandma's bedroom since we spent a lot of time at her place. I want to note here that I am a Christian, yet my family isn't particularly religious and neither was I, at the time of the story at least. Anyway, so obviously I would never do anything like this today, try and contact something paranormal, since it's really not allowed to us Christians, and as we will see at the end of the story, for good riddance. My family knew what we were doing, but as I said, since they weren't overly religious and didn't really believe in the paranormal, they never worried. They all saw this as harmless childish fun. For all they knew, we were just lying in a dark bedroom calling knock grab, knock grab and giggling. Even later, when I told them about the encounters we had, they just dismissed it as A, an act of imagination, B, my cousin somehow playing pranks on me and my younger brother and trying to scare us, or C, an adult was probably secretly pranking us. Now, here are some of the things that happened. One time we were at my grandmother's, in her bedroom, shutters closed and was all dark. We, meaning myself, my cousin and my brother, would lie in my grandma's bed and call it knock grab in the dark and giggle, like we did often. To understand the story, you need to know that my grandma's windows have something that you could describe as somewhat similar to roller blinds but on the outside. You let them down from inside the room but the shutter themselves were on the outside and were made of plastic. If you really want to understand what they look like, quickly open Google Pictures and type in R-O-L-L-A-D-E-N. They're the usual kind of shutters we have in Germany. Anyway, one of the times we again tried to summon the knocked grab, the shutters were actually suddenly lifted up from the outside with a loud noise, and what looked similar to a man looked through the window at us with a creepy mix of extreme anger and extreme pleasure on his face. It was as if though he was partly full of hate, but at the same time, he had the fun of his life scaring us. I also should mention that when I say he looked like a man, I don't mean he looked completely human. The face was somehow too red. It's the kind of red you become when you stand on your head for a long time and all the blood rushes to your face. I also remember that he looked similar to my dad, but more like a bad version of him. Similar, but definitely not him. Apart from the super red face, my dad never really blushes, especially not to that degree. The facial expression, too, was just so... strange. Even if my dad would try and look angry and pleased at the same time, he just wouldn't look like this. The face also looked more... dry is the best word I can think of, as in skin peeling off and has never even remotely been taken care of. He also looked older, and I also vividly remember him saying, I am the Nakgrab in a voice that fit the facial expression full of anger and hate, but at the same time having the time of his life seeing us so scared. It was also a raspy sort of voice, like the voice of a heavy smoker, but still strong, not a whisper or anything. I would just say it was my imagination if it wasn't for the fact that we all screamed at the exact same time, and when we later described it to each other, we all saw the same thing. So... How could it have just been in my imagination if all three of us saw the exact same thing, at the same place in the same time? None of us have ever had hallucinations, so what are the odds of all of us suddenly having one, and the exact same one for no apparent reason? I also remember that since whatever this was looked similar to my dad as we ran outside, I ran to him to either confront him or see whether it still could have somehow been him pranking us, in spite of the differences in appearance. 
but he was sitting at the table with my grandparents, mum, aunt, and uncle and chatting in such a way that it was just clear that he hadn't just left the table seconds ago to prank us. Also, my dad is not a prankster, neither is anyone else in my family, so even if he had decided to prank us, as soon as the three of us would come running to our families explaining what had happened, they would have admitted that my dad was just playing a prank. It's unlikely for any of them to play pranks, let alone for the whole family to join in. My family's just not like that. They're more no-nonsense. Nice, but not the kind of people to joke around and play childish tricks. There were other occurrences, though. I remember when I was at my friend's birthday party when I was maybe six, I wanted to play the same game as I always did with my cousin. My friend was a Christian already back then. Her family was very religious, so... She definitely didn't seem to like the idea, but kind of joined out of peer pressure. And I was so excited that I selfishly didn't care too much about being scared. We went to her room, closed the shutters. Again, the same my grandma has, typical German, Rolladen, and called his name. And there suddenly was a distant knocking against the shutters. They're made of plastic, so you definitely hear it. My friend screamed and ran for it first I don't exactly remember the rest whether her parents just came in and told us to open the shutters again and stop or whether we too just ran either way this is another proof that this was real for two reasons one again everyone in the room heard it so it couldn't have been my imagination also this was a loud clear knocking noise not a sound that the wind could have made and there was also no trees near her window that could have caused the noise. There was just no other reasonable explanation. Also, unlike my grandma's bedroom, my friend's bedroom was on the second or third floor, so there is no way someone could have decided to prank us and knock on the window unless they went through the trouble to go get a ladder, put it in front of my friend's window while the shutters were closed, climb up, knock and quickly climb down again before anyone opened the shutters and looked outside. And even that's impossible, since I never told my friend's parents what we were planning. And again, her parents were very Christian and like my parents, not the kind of people who take pleasure in pranking you. If they would have known what we were doing, they probably would have stopped us. And they certainly were not the kind of people to build up a ladder in front of a whole apartment block with other people watching just to knock on her own daughter's bedroom window to scare her. And when we came outside, her parents were right there. Again, no possible explanation. There is one other story I would like to mention. My cousin had a friend, let's call her N, who she said was kidnapped by the knock grab. To be fair, even though I had seen enough of this then to know it was real, I also knew that my cousin sometimes made up stories back then to scare me. The whole knock grab thing was basically 50% real things I've seen and witnessed and 50% lies about Tim my cousin made up. Even when I was young I knew this so I didn't really believe her with this crazy story. I've also seen her friend several times during the time she was supposedly kidnapped so this was definitely untrue. However I wouldn't be writing this if that was all. Even though I knew that N hadn't been kidnapped and that my cousin had made it up, I still remember that she told me that the knock grab was supposedly holding her prisoner in our basement. So, whether out of my own curiosity or because my cousin encouraged me to do so, I don't remember, I sometimes called her name in the direction of the basement, and several times I would hear a whining sort of noise in response. Again, N was obviously fine and definitely not living in the basement as a prisoner, but something, something that we had probably attracted through all the times we tried to summon the knocked grab was making the noise. I'm not sure about this one, it was a long time ago, but I think I can also remember one instance where N was actually visiting my cousin and I met her and my cousin near the stairs outside my apartment. We actually called her name together then in the direction of the basement and if my blurry and admittedly imperfect memory is correct here, there was actually a whining noise. These were only the big things that happened. In the majority of cases, it was just us in a dark room calling his name, a knocking sound in response, so nothing worth mentioning further. I don't know when we finally stopped, but I guess eventually when I was around 10, I had maybe just grown out of it. 
If you wonder as to my theory as to what the knock grob really was, I can't think of it as anything but a demon. It was attracted by us summoning it, and being scared of it made it stronger, and caused it to come back each time we called. It seemed to like to terrify us in the story where it suddenly opened the shutters and growled in this scratchy voice. The evil grin that just showed how much it was enjoying our fear. Also, I remember that each time I played the game while being a little scared, or not scared at all, nothing would happen. Yet every time I called it while being really scared, there was immediately a knocking sound or a whining, as in the case of N, or the one time I even saw it. Again, this could have just been my fear running wild, but then, how did the others around me witness it too? So it did seem to be attracted by fear. The more fear, the faster it was there. And the red face, the dry skin, the hate in the eyes of that somewhat human-looking thing, it makes sense. As if it was impersonating a human we all knew, my father, but really failing to do so convincingly or probably not even trying since it was meant to scare us. Maybe its intention was to make me scared of my father by impersonating him in this rather grotesque way, I don't know. And still not 100% convinced whether this was all real. This was all very long ago. I was very young, and it has been proven that my brain fills in the blanks after a short time, and that memory is not infallible, like a tape recorder. Yet, as you remember, there were several things in the story that I can't explain that if my memory isn't failing me, must be supernatural. One of the reasons I posted this was to warn parents and future parents to not see these paranormal games as games. I was quite lucky to get away unscathed. For years we called this thing again and again. It appeared again and again, and it certainly must have felt our fear. Considering this, I can only thank God that this thing didn't latch itself onto me, or my cousin, or my younger brother, or my poor friends I dragged into this. It could have haunted my family or my house. It could have tried to do much worse things than scare us. The only reason I believe I got away is that God never let this probably demon do any actual harm. After all, we were just very young kids back then who didn't know better and meant no harm. While I believed in God and Jesus and all of that at the time of the story, I had very limited knowledge of Christianity. I never knew about demons, the occult, about how summoning ghosts, demons, and messing with the paranormal is not allowed to Christians, and I wish I had known. So back to my warning to you parents. Summoning ghosts or demons, witchcraft, and all this doesn't always look like it does in a horror movie. It doesn't require blood, sacrifices, Ouija boards, satanic paintings, and signs on a wall or playing games like Bloody Mary. It can look way more innocent as it did with me. Just a bunch of kids in a dark room calling a nonsensical name and giggling. It seems like fun. As if nothing bad or evil could actually be summoned this way. But it can. There's a small town about 20 minutes from mine called St. Thomas, which is located in Ontario. You know what they say about small towns. Small towns are full of urban legends and spooky stories. In my case, this is true. When I was about 11, my dad and grandma, who also happened to share my fascination with the paranormal, took my sister and I out to the witch's grave. The grave itself is almost impossible to read due to the aging of the stone, my grandmother began to explain the legend. I sat shivering in the back of the car, refusing to get out. I could feel the evil energy around. The legend starts as many do. There was a woman who lived in town, an odd woman. The townsfolk had their suspicions and turned against her. Nobody ever really knew why they decided she was a witch. After they ended her life, they buried her in a small cemetery behind the town church in order to keep her evil energy at bay from the rest of the town, kept surrounded by a holy place. Around the grave are four pillars. The grave and pillars are now black, but the legend says that they were originally white, and the witch's energy changed the color. At night, the pillars supposedly turn white again. The part of the legend that scared me the most as a kid was the curse the witch laid on her grave. 
If you go beyond the four pillars, you will die in five years. I remember my dad pretending to go between them and I was crying and yelling for him not to. A black cat then came over and pawed at him to leave. This is also part of the legend. A black cat protects the grave, ensuring those who are foolish enough to go near it do not go in the pillars. Thankfully, my dad never went between them. Later, my grandma brought one of her close friends there who was not a believer. I didn't know this until the other day when my grandma brought it up to me, but she stepped between the pillars, and she died a few years ago now. Five years after it happened. I don't know if the legend of the witch is true. I'm sure some things have been twisted over the years. All I know is that there's some hocus pocus stuff going on here and nobody talks about it. I have encountered my boyfriend's doppelganger as well as his sister's doppelganger. I will also be changing the sister's name. The first incident was that I saw my boyfriend's. To start, this happened in 2017 when I was 19. We went to bed and I had woken up in the middle of the night. The only light that slightly illuminated the room was coming from the TV. We like to listen to thunderstorms while we sleep. So when I woke up, I turned over and my boyfriend wasn't next to me. Then I saw him pop his head up over the bed and looked at me. I just went back to sleep. The next morning, we were on our way to work and I asked, So what were you doing on the floor in the dark last night? He replied, I wasn't on the floor, what are you talking about? I said, No, I woke up in the middle of the night and looked over and you weren't next to me. Then you popped your head up over the bed and looked at me. Do you not remember that? He said, I was never on the floor. Whatever you saw wasn't me. I then asked, Well, did you get up in the middle of the night at all? His reply, I mean, the only time I got up was to go to the bathroom, but I came right back to bed. This kind of stunned me because I very clearly, vividly remember seeing this happen. I clearly remember waking up and seeing that he wasn't next to me. Then I clearly remember seeing his head come up and look at me from the edge of the bed on his side. We have always known our house was haunted and have had lots of experiences in the house together and separately, so it wasn't an uncommon conversation to have if something strange happened. However, a doppelganger situation had never happened before. The second incident happened in about March of 2019. My boyfriend's sister was getting married and I was a bridesmaid in her wedding. She made plans with me to come over and drop off a little gift she had made for all of her bridesmaids, which was incredibly sweet. In the morning she was supposed to come, I woke up and got ready for her arrival. I went to the bathroom and while I was brushing my teeth, I heard the doorbell ring. I then heard my boyfriend answer the door and greet her. I heard his sister ask, Hey, where's Ashley? Deciding this was my cue, I clean off my toothbrush and walk out of the bathroom. When I walked out of the bathroom, there was no one at the front door, and I surprisingly found my boyfriend in our bedroom. I was confused on how he could have gotten to the bedroom so quickly considering I opened the bathroom door seconds after hearing that she was here. I asked my boyfriend, Where's Vivian? Did she already leave? He just said, What? She was never here. I told him that I heard the doorbell ring in conversation between them. No sooner than that, I get a message from Vivian saying that she wasn't able to make it. I suppose the doppelganger situation would make sense because the house we lived in was originally built and owned by their great uncle who ended his life by a fatal gunshot wound to the head in the backyard. Although, I don't think he ever truly left. To start, I should probably tell you that I am one-third Native American. I have always been a bit sensitive to the supernatural. A couple of weeks ago, I worked an odd shift, 3pm to 3am. 
After work, I decided that I was going to go to the local native reservation for cigarettes and gas. When I had finished getting gas, I was a little bit too tired to drive. I decided to take a nap in the darker corner of the parking lot. I faded off into sleep. At 4.37, I was awoken by a howl, like a wolf, but more like a man mimicking a wolf. I look out from my car, and there was a wolf-like man, white in color, standing about 50 to 60 feet in front of my car. It slowly walked towards me. I started the car and put it in reverse. I decided to get out of there. As I was leaving, it scratched the trunk of my car. It's been three weeks since then, and I'm working my normal shift at work 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. I have seen it many places since, and I feel it's getting closer to me. I talked to the local native chief, and he says that if it is following me like this, that it may be hunting me, or that it could be trying to protect me from something more dangerous. He also told me that he can do nothing to help me. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, when it rains, it twerks. <laughs>